morning on Generation X versus Generation Z. Who spawned this generation? Okay, so today we're going to define what's a generation, discuss the classification of generations, go over generational key historical events when traits, and also um, um, how generations are shaping the education today and also the workplace. So what's a generation? A generation is a group of people who are roughly the same age and who are influenced by a set of significant events. These experiences supposedly create commonalities, making those in a group more similar to each other and more different from other groups and from groups of the same age in the past. Though there is a consensus on the general time period of generations, there is not an agreement on the exact year that each generation begins and ends. So something interesting is happening right now. There is five generations living side by side. This can be quite challenging, but it can work once you understand the different generations. So right now, the five generations living side by side are traditionalist, baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, and Generation Z. So we all did the quiz, am I correct? Yeah. All right, so how the quiz works. So we're gonna identify what generation that, uh, we're gonna see what generation we identified with. So all the way on the bottom, on the right, hand side, you're going to see the um, answer key to the quiz. So if you answer mostly A's, you're a traditionalist. Anybody here a traditionalist? Okay. According to this, I am. According to that. Okay. Um, how about baby boomers? We have any baby boomers here? I'm a baby boomer. Okay. How about Gen Xers? Any Gen Xers here? I've got figured you have mostly Gen Xers. Okay, and if you circle mostly D's, that means you're a millennial. Oh, we have new millennials here. Yay! Okay, so now that we know who we, you know, what generation we identify with, let's examine the different generations. Okay, so traditionalists, also known as the silent generation, Veterans, greatest generation, traditionalist population is approximately 55 million. Since this generation was born between 1925 and 1945, you don't see many of them in the workplace. The majority of them are retirees. However, they still impressively make up 3% of the workforce. This is a generation who firmly believes in an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. They're extremely loyal and enjoy being respected for that. Since they're conformists, they value most of job titles and money. When it comes to technology, this generation has to adapt. The only entertainment they grew up with were the voices coming out of the box. They were raised sitting around the radio with their family, listening to spell-binding stories like The Shadow, Dick Tracy, Lux Radio Hour, and Our Mrs. Brooks. This filled their evening with suspense and entertainment. When you think about the wonders of those times, it was the minds that created the pictures that they heard from the radio. There were no MTVs, or videos. They also were raised listening to their parents' sprouting proverbs that centered around work, patient, and delayed gratification. Those proverbs were part of the traditionalist DNA. They quoted them often to their own children. I still repeat these adages today. So if you could take out on your packet, you also have words of wisdom, kind of look at them and you can see how many you actually um, use 
I've used every single one of these so many times. Um, but you know what would really be interesting? If you can show this to your, your kids, Gen Z, or even millennials, you know, and see how many they're familiar with. So it's kind of funny. So um, this is just for you. Okay, so um, some uh, traditionalist key historic events, all right? The Depression, Pearl Harbor, World War II, the Cold War era, Cuban Missile Crisis, and the mindset of the traditionalists was children's were seen but not heard. Some common traits are they're patriotic, dependable, conformist, respect authority, rigid, social and financially conservative, and they have a solid work ethic. Hey, baby boomers. Yay, I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> Population is approximately 76 million. Baby boomers make up 28% of Americans. Born between 1946 and 1964, this group is also referred to as the me generation. They predominantly in their 50s and 60s and are well established in their careers. As such, they hold position of power, authority, such as law firm leaders and executives. Boomers are often ambitious, loyal, work-centric, and cynical. They prefer monetary rewards, but also enjoy non-monetary rewards, like flexible retirement planning and peer recognition. They also don't require constant feedback and have an all is well unless you say something mindset. Since boomers are a gold-oriented generation, they can be motivated by promotion, professional development, and have their expertise value and acknowledge. Prestigious job titles and recognition like office size and parking spaces are also important to boomers. They can also be motivated through high levels of responsibility, perks, raises, and challenges. It's expected that around 70 million boomers will be retired by 2020. Boomers are paying attention to their 401ks, matching funds, sabbaticals, and catch up retirement funding. So some key historical events for baby boomers are the assassination of John and Robert Kennedy and Martha Luther King, first man on the moon, Watergate, the Vietnam War, and also protests and sit-ins. Some common traits, they're workaholics, idealists, competitive, loyal, materialistic, and they seek personal fulfillment. Okay, Gen Generation Xers, also known as Latchkey Generation, MTV Generation, and Busters. A large population of Gen Xers come from single parent families. Generation X has around 44 to 50 million Americans who were born between 1965 and 1980. They're smaller than their previous and succeeding generation, but they're often credited for bringing work-life balance. This is because they saw firsthand how their hardworking parents became so burnt out. Members of the, gener of the generation are in their 30s and 40s and spent a lot of time alone as children. This created an entrepreneurial spirit with them. In fact, Gen Xers make up the highest percentage of startup founders. Even if they're not starting their own business, Gen Xers prefer to work independently with minimal supervision. They also value opportunities to grow and make choices, as well as having relationships with mentors. They also believe that promotion should be based on confidence and not by rank, age, or seniority. Gen Xers can be motivated by flexible schedules, benefits like telecommuting, recognition from the boss, and they prefer bonus, 
stocks and gift cards as monetary rewards. Some key historical events for Generation Xers was the age academic, uh, academic uh, space uh, shuttle challenge catastrophe, the fall of the Berlin Wall, Oklahoma City bombing, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky scandal. Some traits, they're self-reliant, adaptable, cynical, they distrust authority, resourceful, entrepreneurial, and technology savvy. The next generation is the Generation Y or the Millennials, uh, also known as the Millennials. Gen Y population is approximately 80 million. Born after 1980, this tech savvy generation is currently the largest age group in the country. They're in their 20s and are beginning to come into their own in the workforce. They're the fastest growing segment in today's workforce. For some millennials, they're content with selling their skills to the highest bidder. That means unlike boomers, they're not as loyal. In most cases, they had no problem jumping from one organization to another. That's not to say that you can't motivate this generation, because you can by offering them skill training and mentoring feedback. Culture is also stream, extremely important to the millennials. They are more ethnically and racially diverse than the older generation. They want to work in an environment where they can collaborate with others, flexible schedule, time off, and embracing the latest technology to communicate are also important to millennials. The generation also thrives when their structure, stability, learning opportunities, and immediate feedback. If you do offer monetary rewards, they prefer a stock option. Some key historic events are the Columbine High School shooting, September 11th, a terrorist attack, Enron and other corporate scandals, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and Hurricane Katrina. Some traits that they share, they're entitled, optimistic, civic-minded, close parental involvement, value work-life balance, impatient, multitasking, and team-oriented. Generation Z, also known as iGen, GenTech, NextGen, and uh, digital natives. Generation Z population is approximately 23 million and growing. This generation is right on the heels of the millennials and they're starting to enter the workplace. Gen Z currently make up one fourth of Americans population, making this generation larger than baby boomers or millennials. This generation is motivated by social rewards, mentorship, and constant feedback. They also want to be do meaningful and be given responsibility. Like their predecessors, they also demand flexible schedule. Other ways to motivate this generation is through experimental rewards and badges such as those earned in gaming and opportunity for personal growth. They also expect structure, clear direction, and transparency. Some key historic events for Generation Z. The invention of Facebook, the presence of texting and terrorist, terrorist attack everywhere, no child left behind, cyberbullying, Columbine safety requirements, cell phone family plans, computers in high school curriculum, and a first text messaging phone. This generation is accepting, health conscious, cynical, private, independent, and aware of a troubled planet. They're justice minded. All right, I have a 
video that I'm going to show you. Differences between generations X, Y, and Z. Which one are you? Since you're on the internet right now, and assuming it's not your first time, you've probably already noticed that this space is pretty much dominated by a younger crowd. You've likely heard them referred to as millennials, or is it Gen Z? And how are they different from generations X and Y? What's with all the labels anyway? And how can you make heads or tails of which one you belong to, and what defines your generation? Well, according to sociologist Carl Mannheim, it all comes down to generational location, meaning that all members of a generation share a similar collective experience. We'll get into what those might be for your generation, but before we do that, take this moment to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so that you'll always be the first to see all our new videos. Now, where were we? Ah, yes, people are categorized into generations depending on when they were born. For today's video, we're going to focus on people born in the U.S. As of now, there are five living generations. The traditionalists, also known as the silent generation, who were born before 1945. Then there's the baby boomers, born between 1946 and 1964. Anyone born between 1965 and 1979 are considered Generation X, while Millennials, or Generation Y, were born between 1980 and 1995. Finally, there's Gen Z, or Centennials, who were born from 1996 to the present. These ranges are just approximations, of course. You can be born within three years of the beginning or end of a generation and still belong to it. What's more important is the collective experiences people born within these years share. The traditionalist generation, who are now age 73 and older, has a wide range of collective experiences. Some are old enough to remember one or both of the World Wars, the Great Depression, and even the invention of sliced bread. As a result of these experiences, most traditionalists value hard work, commitment, and practicality, and they don't like to be wasteful. That's not to say other generations don't share these values. It's just that the scarcity of resources during these trying times fostered a culture of doing whatever it took to survive. They also tend to be more respectful of authority. That is, they always respect your elder generation, which you might recognize in your older relatives. Traditionalists gave birth to the baby boomers, who were, of course, part of the huge birth rate increase following the Second World War. Boomers changed a lot about American society, particularly advertising and marketing. Since they were such a large part of the population, they did a lot of the spending and had a great impact on the economy once they entered and left the workforce. The post-war political landscape was pretty rocky, so there's plenty of collective experiences for this generation to choose from. The Vietnam War and the controversy surrounding the draft. The Cold War and the Red Scare. The Civil Rights Movement. Woodstock and Counterculture. The Moon Landing. And the list goes on. All these experiences made for a wide range of characteristics and values. This generation started out liberal when they were involved in all the political and social movements, but they then grew more conservative as they aged. There's some disagreement as to when exactly the boomers end and Gen X begins. A lot of people born from 1961 to 1964 don't identify as boomers and don't have any emotional connection to the collective experiences that shape them. This has prompted some researchers to classify Generation X as those born from 1961 to 1981. Gen X got to experience the aftermath of all the changes the boomers made. With both parents now entering the workforce, Gen X kids had less adult supervision than previous generations, which caused them to be more peer-oriented. The use of computers also took off during these years, making Gen X more entrepreneurial than their parents and grandparents. The collective experiences of Gen X include the crack epidemic and the emergence of the AIDS crisis, which made them much more cynical and disaffected as teens and young adults than boomers or traditionalists have ever been. Music also defined a lot of this generation, with the invention of music videos and the popularization of hip-hop, rap, and grunge. Ah, millennials. They've been the topic of much debate, even over when their generation starts and ends. Some demographers have decided that millennials were born as early as 1977, while others extend their cutoff to as late as 1999. And, of course, there's the ever-popular millennial bashing, 
Other generations complain that millennials are selfish, entitled, narcissistic, addicted to their phones, lazy, impatient, impulsive, overly sensitive, weak will, and the name calling goes on and on. While it's true that some millennials share these traits, the same can be said of literally anyone else in the world. There's no need to vilify an entire generation for wanting and expecting good things for themselves or for taking full advantage of the awesome technology that surrounds them. In fact, the sweeping technological advances of the digital age have made millennials much more group-oriented than their predecessors, which accounts for their social progressiveness and tendency towards left-leaning politics. Gen Z includes everyone born in the 21st century. They can be the children of either Gen X or millennial parents, and this difference can affect their relationship with the technology they've grown up with. Gen X parents, who were raised without widespread access to the internet, are more likely to be restrictive with their kids' devices. Millennial parents, on the other hand, grew up as the technology we have now is developing and gaining popularity, so they tend to be more lenient when it comes to their children using gadgets. Such digital savvy lends itself to the entrepreneurial spirit mentioned earlier with Gen X, so Gen Z also tends to value collaboration more, in both school and work. Centennials were born into an environment where digital devices were widespread and readily available. So they have a very different relationship with it than previous generations. In fact, 40% of centennials surveyed said that a reliable Wi-Fi connection is more important to them than reliable bathrooms. Of course, it's possible they might use that Wi-Fi to find a nearby public restroom. Still, it's the principle of the matter. Millennials and Centennials share the most similarities in collective experiences out of all the living generations, so there's a lot of debate about the exact range for each of them. No matter where exactly these generations start, they've mostly experienced the same things. A majority of Millennials can remember where they were when the September 11th terrorist attacks happened. They can tell you exactly when they got their first cell phone and when they first made a MySpace account. They can recognize the theme songs to Family Ties, Rugrats, and other popular shows of the 80s and 90s. Someone born in 1996 might not remember or have an emotional connection to the events of 2001, which is why some researchers classify them as centennials rather than millennials. The technological immersion that marks the turn of the century and defines the younger generations has definitely affected how they communicate. Everything online happens pretty much instantaneously, so millennials and centennials tend to expect other things to happen quickly too, especially responses to texts and emails. It's also led to a specific sort of humor in Gen Y and Z that completely baffles older generations. A lot of this humor references other jokes, so if you haven't seen a specific Vine or SpongeBob episode, then it just sounds like nonsense. You can even count meme culture as a collective experience the two generations share. But when it comes down to it, generational lines are just as arbitrary as borders on a map. They don't really matter. They're just stuff we made up to help define ourselves better. But really, you can define yourself and your generation however you want. So, what defines your generation? When do you think each of the generations start and stop? What are some collective experiences people share in the place you're from? Tell us in the comments below. Give this video a like if you found it useful, share it with your friends and family, and always remember to stay on the bright side of life. Millennials versus Generation Z. How do they compare and what's the difference? Epochs follow each other, and the farther, the faster.
and they would watch MTV. They were the first generation that had TV focused directly at, the, uh, at their culture, at the things they were interested in. As the video said, they were somewhat cynical uh, based on the world that they saw coming up, and they were influenced by grunge music and indie films, and they were often labeled as slackers. I think question mark we got that is a little pejorative, but it was a common term used for Gen Xers. But who are they now, now that they're adults? The research describes them as active, happy, they achieved work-life balance. Um, although they were labeled as slackers, they've been credited with the entrepreneurial tendencies. So uh, they really overcome that label. And um, they're the parents of Generation Z. So um, Gen Xers and Millennials gave rise to the Generation Z. So um, Gen Z fun facts. Generation Z has probably never used a typewriter, a rotary phone, you know, they've never had a dial phone, wait for that zero to come back, transistor radio, a slide projector, a floppy disk, a Rolodex, don't even know what that is, a sheet of carbon paper, a tape recorder, or a pay phone, a phone book, a paper map, an encyclopedia, a disposable camera, remember when those were everywhere? They never even used them. A CD case, they don't have CDs, they don't need a case to carry them, or MySpace. Sorry, Tom. Uh, but what are they like? Let's talk about these screen agers. They're digital natives, and we hear that term a lot. It really refers to the fact that they're the first generation that have always lived in a digital world. They've always had the internet, they've always had a cell phone, they've always been connected through social media. They're digital. That means that they live not only in the physical world, but in the digital world. They don't draw a distinction between the physical and the digital. It's all life to them. It's not just tech. It's an integrated part of their world. Um, they text, they chat, they FaceTime, they stream music and movies. They have communication and information instantly at their fingertips. They have FOMO. You've probably heard this one, fear of missing out. Because their communication is instant and ongoing, their world never sleeps. It's important to them to keep up with their world and to be in the know. Uh, because it's ongoing 24 hours a day, there's no good time for them to feel comfortable unplugging from it for fear of being out of the loop. And they feel pressure to be there for their friends 24-7. If somebody has a breakup at midnight, you know, they need to be there to support them and whatnot. And then socially, they get the fear of missing out because if their friends are out having a good time, they get instant pictures. Oh, look what you're missing out on. Mm -hmm. They seek instant gratification because they're digital, because their digital world is instantaneous. They don't have little patience for waiting in line and for the slow pace that happens in the physical world. It doesn't make sense to them. Um, on the plus side, they are open-minded. They are limited by proximity in their information and connection to the world, so they have more exposure to diversity and culture and ideas, and they tend to be more open-minded and tolerant of differences than previous generations. And this leads them to subscribe to a philosophy of fluidity. Um, it's a more fluid mindset, less concern over binary contradictions, black or white, gay or straight, male or female. They tend to see such things more on a continuum, and they're more accepting of others' rights to live as they see themselves, and less concerned with labeling. They're aware of societal problems and justice concerns. They're coming to age in the time of Me Too, Black Lives Matter, the gun control, the LGBTQ movement. And they believe in um, speaking truth to power. They aren't just aware of the movements. They're not uh, you know, just civic-minded like their Gen X and millennial parents. But they believe in putting their money where their mouth is, speaking up, protesting, signing petitions, walking out. They think it's important to be activists for political and social change. And um, I think I gotta have my gotta have it behind. <laughs> and they're changing education. We're gonna talk about that um, in a moment. Yeah, we have to. More technical. We need a Gen Z kid here to run this. Yeah. Except for the boomers growing up in the 1960s. Looking specifically at numbers, we define Gen Z as those before 1995 and 2004. 1995 just happens to be the year the internet was commercialized, so that also captures 
three generation of people who were born um, after the internet existed. We don't know a world without the internet. But compared to previous generations, they spend a lot more time communicating with their friends electronically, and they also spend less time hanging out with their friends in person. My generation were truly digital natives. We've really only known a world where our phones are smart. You know, we turn to technology for a lot of things, whether it be entertainment, research, education. It's truly just part of who we are. I'm not entirely convinced that iGen's uh, skill with social media is going to be a complete positive. It's also linked to depression and anxiety and unhappiness, especially for people who are spending too much time on social media who are comparing themselves to others too much. You know, people always talk about taking digital detoxes and stepping away for a little bit. And I don't know if it's necessarily cutting out the phone for a month at a time, but understanding that it's okay to put down your phone for a couple hours, don't have it at the dinner table, try not to spend your phone right before bed. There's just time and a place for everything, and I think understanding it is really important. I think some of the parents can do to help with this anxiety, the phones and information overload, and really helping them sort of analyze and prioritize the information is what we find is something that's definitely needed with this generation. At the moment, uh, what many people think of when they think of iGen is a teen or young adult you know, looking at his or her phone. Um, but I think that would come in for other things as time goes on. One of our traits that you know is very upfront with my generation is that we're very, very realistic. At a young age, we were thrown into a world that you could say wasn't the prettiest, you know, we grew up amongst the 2009 recession, after 9-11, and our parents didn't tell us we could necessarily be whatever we wanted. They told us that it's a hard world out there, you're going to have to work your butt off, and if you're not willing to, there's plenty of others that will. <clears throat> Gen Z entering the workforce, it's going to be a lot of change. For Gen Z, if I can log on and log in, I'm at work. So I think the physical office is really going to be challenged. Another thing that we know about this generation that are really going to challenge is the pace at which things get done. Everyone talks about work-life balance, you know, I come to work in my life, and works from nine to five, and then your life, and how do we balance the two? What I love about Gen Z is they just don't think it works, and it really hasn't worked. What they go for is work-life blend, where work and life are seven days a week, 24 hours a day. By spring of their senior year, our Gen teens are less likely, compared to previous generations, to have their driver's license, to work at a paid job, to go out on dates, to drink alcohol. And we've already seen this with millennials in young adulthood, taking longer to settle into careers, to marry, to have children, uh, and so on. So the whole developmental trajectory is slowed down. Gen Z is by far the most diverse generation ever, and we're also the most interconnected around the globe. And part of the reason is, you know, now with our generation, if something happens, the entire world finds out immediately through social media, through hashtags. We're always connected to each other, so we're, we feel as though whether it happened in the same building or a thousand miles away is immediately affecting us because we hear about it and so we feel obligated to help and be a part of the situation, whether it's positive or negative. They are also the one that values equality the most, whether we're talking about race or gender or sexual orientation or transgender issues. Um, they're really much more open um, and focused on equality. We really do not fear that. So whether it be through political activation or entering a new workplace or trying new things, we're willing to try something and fail. And this is going to have a great impact on the other generation. For the rest of us who have been so cautious, that's going to really rub off to get us to step outside our box and maybe try some new things. Amy, it says you are a trick. social learning. They're accustomed to being constantly connected with their peers and so they like collaborating. They like group work experiences rather than sitting passively for lectures. They are good collaborators with teachers. They've always collaborated with their parents and this generation, uh, because they've been raised by parents who are much more involved in their lives, they're not latchkey kids, um, their parents consult more with them about what they want and what's interesting to them and what's going on. So collaboration with adults comes naturally to them. 
They like a fully immersive educational experience. Um, they're used to a multimedia approach. They enjoy hands-on activities. Education is responding to that by providing more meaningful group work, not just kids working in groups, but with real guidance and input from the teacher who interacts with them in their groups, serving, as they're saying now, as the guide on the side, not just the sage on the stage, lecturing to them. And this is more appealing to Gen Zers. Um, online is how they function, so digital learning is important to them. It's how they function, it's how they organize their world, and colleges are getting on board with this as well. Um, Ohio State is now issuing iPads to all incoming freshmen. They had 42 courses this year which required the use of the iPad, and they have more on, coming online for next year. Colleges have apps for campus maps, bus routes, course planning, and student life organizations and activities to respond to this need from the students. Um, they're about on-demand learning. They can access it when they want, how they want. They self-educate through YouTube videos, through Khan Academy, Babel, virtual school. They're learning languages, learning about other cultures, learning things like computer coding, all on their own. And Generation Z will be Generation Smart about college. You might think generations that are do-it-yourselfers, YouTube obsessed, they'd be less likely to rely on a traditional college education. But still, according to a recent survey, 89% think that the college education is valuable. They care about education. They care about their academic performance. They want to have an impactful career where they can make a difference. And so they know college is the way to get there, and they're taking it seriously. College-age Gen Zers have heard a lot about millennial student loan debt, so they're starting to make their own money, they're starting to save money, um, and of course we mentioned they're interested in activism and politics. So their college community is a little bit different than previous generations. They're going to be working, they're going to be protesting, they're going to be doing some other things there, all the while taking it very seriously. Generation Z will differ from previous generations in the workplace. They're motivated by security. They came up, as we said, during the recession. They've seen a world that's maybe not as secure as the traditionalists saw during their uh, work time. They're concerned with student loans, so they want that secure job position. They're competitive because they want security and because they know it's a big world out there. They um, know there's a lot of competition. They want to be successful, so they're competitive. They're independent, you know, their world is digital, it's tailored for them, they can pick and choose, and they like an independent mindset in the workplace. Where previous generations were trying to be multitaskers, we're trying to do everything at once, um, they're not as good at that because of their digital um, outlook. They don't have the attention span that previous generations may have had to do a lot of things at one time. But they're great um, task switchers. If you watch them on their phone, you know, they're constantly switching from Snapchat to Instagram, to message to schoolwork to Instagram to Snapchat. They're good at switching back and forth rapidly between different things. They're entrepreneurial, like their parents, maybe even more so. Um, because they don't want to be a small cog in a big corporate deal. They want to blaze their own trail. They want to craft their own independent business. And they want to have an impact, and they can do that by being entrepreneurial. They're more involved with digital work. They're going to work for Amazon more than a brick and mortar store. They're going to Skype rather than physically going to a meeting. They're going to apply and interview for jobs online rather than in person. And they're going to do more working from home. And they want to be catered to. They're used to their world being personalized. One size fits all is not them. So, how do we support our own personal little Gen Z persons? Um, for one thing, they sometimes have the idea that if it's on the internet, it's true. And that's not just because they're young or naive, but it's because that's their source of information. That's where their friends communicate with them. That's where they find out about things. And so when they're getting involved in a research project, it's important to help them to realize you have to be critical sometimes of the things you read. You have to read them critically. You have to really think about it. You have to examine the sources and the information that you're getting. Not everything on the internet is necessarily true. Um, you mentioned attention span. I don't mean that to be pejorative. It's just that their world is faster. It's more digital. They process things uh, more quickly. So if you give them a huge, lengthy, 
you know, long-term project, that may be overwhelming to them. You have to help them learn to divide it up into smaller pieces where they can use that skill of switching between things back and forth, you know, without getting bored with maintaining information. They can divide that longer. Fake news, that's a big topic right now. Um, you know, they're all interested in that. And again, it's an easy thing to believe what you're seeing, believe what you're hearing. Um, or if they're trying to take in everything and it's two conflicting sides, they may become overwhelmed and just shut down entirely. They want to be involved. They're interested in the issues. They want to make a difference. So, um, you know, talk to them. Talk to them about the difference between fact and opinion and about being uh, wary of the sources that are not as legitimate as other sources. And being, uh, doing research about the sources, where the information's coming from. Discuss the issues with them as a family. They want to be involved. Um, digital, digital, it's not tech to them. What we see as entertainment, they see as just an integral part of their life. So uh, work with them on that balance sometimes, that, that sometimes it is okay to come up for air a little bit from the internet. Je uh, research shows that while they're physically safer than ever at their age, earlier generation to the traditionalists, some of them were you know, in a trench somewhere in, in Germany at this age. Uh, they're physically safer, but they're more emotionally fragile. Because they're more protected, it's hard for them to think about failing or making a mistake or not being perfect. And, you know, we need to show them sometimes in life that's going to happen. Everything's not going to be perfect. And um, you know, take little risks to see that, oh, okay, that didn't turn out exactly like I wanted, but it's okay. I survived it, you know, and I'm going to be okay. And that's how they develop that confidence and resiliency that's going to enable them to be uh, more successful and happy later on. <laughs> and help them fight the battle of FOMO, the fear of missing out. Help, um, help them to see the value in getting out and um, enjoying experiences, just for experience's sake. You know, you don't have to be curating your Instagram page all the time. Sometimes it's okay to just you know, look at what you're doing and enjoy it and have those memories for yourself. Talk with them about their friends, expecting them to be available 24-7. That's an insidious thing. And you have to have the discussion about, you know, if your friends love you, they're going to want what's best for you. And what's best for you sometimes is to have family time, to just have downtime, uh, to sleep. So those things are important. Help them practice a little bit. You know, it's okay to unplug and not feel that pressure that they feel to be on all the time. Um, so in summary, while they differ in some aspects from previous generations, Gen Z wants similar things from life as their elders did, but on their own terms. You know, they want a successful career, but it has to be tailored for them, and it has to be impactful and make a difference. It has to be meaningful for them. They, of course, want a healthy, happy family life, but it may come later for them than previous generations. They may be putting that off uh, and not be in a rush to get that started. They may want to do their other things to uh, make more of a difference in the world. They do that. And personal fulfillment. It's important to them, but they may find it in reaching outward toward other people, making societal changes, making a positive impact on others. So um, these new digital digital people, who are they? They're not aliens. They're not even androids, even though they seem like it sometimes. Um, they're just the next generation, and they're coming into their own. They're doing it their own way. And the important work of our generation is to make sure that we do our best to support them so they can have a happy future and, and, and as they call it, live their best life. Thank you. Sources that we used in coming up with this presentation, and there's really some interesting reading in there. If you had a chance to read a couple of those books, if you haven't read um, Angela Duckworth's book on grit, um, grit and resiliency are some things that colleges and the workforce are reporting back that they feel like the Generation Z really needs to work on. You know, life's not going to be perfect, and um, they need to have the tools to deal with those little setbacks. Um, funny story, UCF in their orientation last year asked parents to please, please make sure your child knows what to do when they get cold. Because last winter, their clinic, uh, their health, student health room was overwhelmed with students who were really, really upset because they were sick and had a cold and they weren't sure what to do. And so they said, you know, make sure that your kids are, you know, know what to do when there's little bumps in the room come along and, and they have the emotional tools. Um, we have some magazine articles here on the internet, a couple of those, one from uh, today, Parents 18, Four Things You Need to Know to Raise a Gen Xer, and um, 
the mindset list is where some of that information came from. It's what have these students never seen or never done or don't have any issues. If you get a chance, look through those resources. And we want to thank you very much for coming out today. Um, we have a little raffle, raffle off some prizes.